I'd like to thank Vinu Srinivasan and the entire Srinivasan family for this incredible honor. I would also like to thank um, our host, Professor Krishnamurthy, and his dad, Professor Srinivas, uh, for uh, allowing us to participate in this wonderful event. I'd also like to thank uh, my fellow faculty who uh, did a wonderful job telling us about the disorders that affect the developing brain, Dr. Chilio, Dr. Mink, and Dr. Matthews. And I'd also like to thank all of the participants who uh, interacted so wonderfully with us and engaged us with so many uh, challenging questions. I wanted to mention that my visit to VHS the other day was truly the highlight of this vacation trip. Um, it was uh, such a wonderful, cheerful place for patients to recover. And the part of the visit that struck me as so remarkable was the integration of the family in the care of the patients there. The family is with the patient, the family learns how to take care of the patient, so when they go home, the patient isn't at a loss. And I think we have so much to learn from that. We strive for family-centered care in the United States, but I think we fall very short, and I think we have a lot to learn from the model set up by the physicians at VHS. So thank you for allowing me to uh, participate in that. I also enjoyed the uh, seminars with the PhD and master's students, the wonderful, challenging, and interesting cases. Uh, we saw some of them that made us scratch our heads a little bit, and uh, the presentations of the students. So without further ado, let me talk a little bit about the newborn with a vulnerable brain and give you my perspective on neuroprotection and repair and the possibilities that we have for brain-focused care of our challenged children. But let's speak a minute about the magnitude of the problem. If we look at term births, annually there are 26 million births in India which represents 20% of the global live births. There are a million deaths per year, which is 25% of the global burden. Here in Tamil Nadu, 30 to 39 per 1,000 live births uh, suffer. And birth asphyxia, the most common abnormality that we see in these term babies represents about a fifth of those neonatal deaths. Preterm births, another portion of the population that contribute to the vulnerability, represent 15 million births per year, and a million of those babies will die. 60% of preterm births occur in Africa and South Asia. And it's surprising, though, that the highest are Brazil, India, Nigeria, and the United States. M much of that is due to the increase in fertility treatment and multiple births and those children being born too early, infection, and then systemic disease in the moms. So how do we help our most vulnerable patients? We do it by brain-focused care. And at UCSF, we set up the nation's first neurointensive care nursery that I'm going to tell you a little bit about at the end of the talk. And here you could see me on the one side and Dr. Rowich, the other co-director of our institute, on the other. He's a neonatologist, and we care for these babies hand in hand. In the middle is a picture of an incubator that we developed with General Electric to safely transport babies so that we could study their brains by magnetic resonance imaging. 
And I'm delighted that in my lifetime, we developed the first therapy to treat term babies, and that's using hypothermia. So cooling babies has actually now reduced death or disability in this population of babies by 11%. That may not sound like a lot, but it's just the beginning of our ability to impact therapy, and I want to talk about that a little bit. And here you can see a baby on a cooling blanket, comfortably resting, uh, sedated by morphine. And you can see the amount of technology it takes to keep that baby stable during this 72 hours that we uh, keep that baby cold. I want to show you that there's a huge window of opportunity. Babies have strokes. They have strokes at the same rate that older adults have strokes. So it's a big problem. And that problem occurs over a period of time. So we can look at our imaging, and I'll draw your attention. I can't use the pointer because there are too many screens. But if you look at that bottom row, that flare image, you'll see that white arrow and an arrow pointing to a line that looks brighter. And look at how that gets bigger and bigger over the first week of life. That is telling us that these babies are having injury that goes on and on. We need to do something about that. Cooling is only the beginning of what we might be able to do. And timing is really what we have to understand when we think about the injury that's happening in these babies' brains. Because initially, in the first couple of hours after birth, when they're asphyxiated, they may experience what we call oxidative stress, and their brains are overexcited. But days and weeks go on where inflammation occurs in the brain. And it's not until that time that the brain can start to repair itself. And during that whole period of time, there's cell death that we have to fight against. So how might we do this? Well, a while ago, people decided, and this is now probably a, a study that set the stage for using allopurinol, which is an antioxidant, and first used it in rats, saw that it was effective against hypoxia ischemia, but then when people looked at the babies who were given short doses of allopurinol, there was no improvement. And so that made people think that maybe we're giving the drug too late after their injury, even though some babies with cardiac disease seem to benefit. So the folks at um, the uh, University of Utrecht in the Netherlands have designed a trial which is ongoing right now where pregnant mothers who are at term with the risk of a baby who might be born uh, with hypoxia will receive a dose of allopurinol and then they will be studied without short-term outcomes to look for oxidative stress and then long-term outcomes to look for their uh, long-term neurological outcome. So this study was started two years ago and is in progress. There are many other antioxidant strategies that have been developed in animal models, and some of them are coming to human trial. And so I've told you about hypothermia. I'm going to mention it to you in a little bit more detail. And I'm also going to talk to you about erythropoietin, the growth factor that Lance Armstrong made famous. Uh, but this is for a better use. It's for the brain not to win uh, race bike races. And then melatonin, uh, which is a drug that many of us in the audience here, at least my colleagues from the U.S., have taken extensively this week to try to get to sleep at night, but is actually a good antioxidant. And again, going back to the animal model, where we have to start in order to understand what the mechanism of action is in a stroke model in a newborn rat, Despite the fact that it didn't have any impact on the size of the injury in that animal, this drug actually reduced inflammation by decreasing microglial activation 
and a pre preserved white matter, the ability of the brain to uh, uh, create that wrapping around the axons. And there are more elegant studies that have just been published by Nikki Robertson at, at uh, UK, and she used a neonatal swine model. So these piglets are very much like uh, the human brain at birth and uh, much better than rodents. And she saw by a number of measures when she combined hypothermia, which we're doing now, and then added melatonin, she saw improvement in function by virtue of the amplitude integrated EEG, which monitors brain activity. You can see the hypo T and mel melatonin in the blue in the upper, upper panel on the left is better. She measured oxidative stress by doing an MR spectroscopic scan like the ones I showed you yesterday. And again, the babies with combined therapy had less oxidative stress, as you can see with the green asterisks. And they had less cell death, especially in the area of the brain that is most challenged, that deep gray nuclei that I showed you yesterday in those films, the thalamus. So there's an observational study going on in France right now. Uh, this is being done at INSERM by Valerie Biron, a former postdoc. Um, they're measuring melatonin levels in preterm and term newborns, and the hypothesis is that babies are deficient in melatonin, and if we do something as simple as supplement them, we might be able to help them if they are challenged with birth asphyxia. And in Australia at Monash University, we have people looking at melatonin to prevent brain injury in babies who are born with, who are born small for gestational age with injury uterine growth retardation. And uh, they will look at oxidative stress, much like the allopurinol study is doing, and they'll look at a composite neonatal outcome to see if neurodevelopment is improved in these babies. Antenatal magnesium has been studied again. This is targeting the mother before the baby is born. And even though magnesium didn't risk, uh, reduce the risk of the composite outcome of cerebral palsy or death, it did reduce cerebral palsy as well as the moderate to severe cerebral palsy without increasing the risk of death. There's always a concern that when we institute a therapy, that we will reduce mortality but create more damaged children. That was the biggest fear with the hypothermia trials, but it did not come to play. And although you need one case of cerebral palsy, uh, you need to treat 56 patients to pre prevent one case, it's still worth thinking about. There's another free radical scavenger called N-acetylcysteine when it's coupled to a, a particle, a dendromer that could cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, it can prevent cerebral palsy, and this is a study that was dendromer. They saw improvement in function as well as in structure. My favorite drug, I think, is erythropoietin because of its uh, pleiotrophic effects. It's actually a cytokine. It has immune effects, vascular effects, and morphogenic effects, which I'm going to show you briefly. The good news is that it, it and its receptor are expressed in high quantities around the time of birth, and it's induced when the brain is exposed to hypoxia. So it's a natural endogenous candidate, but maybe not enough is being produced, so maybe if we give a little extra, we might see protection. And this has been true in a number of models in animals. And what we showed, taking advantage of that first slide I showed you, where I showed you the baby with a stroke who was having that stroke occur over an entire week of time, uh, realizing there's this huge window of opportunity, we looked first at a single dose given right after the baby was born. We saw an immediate effect, but it was not sustained. 
But if we waited and gave another dose at 24 hours and a third dose at seven days of life, we saw absolute improvement, not only in the structure of the brain, but also in the function of the brain. So in a RAB model of stroke, we're able to use a variety of tests to see how the animals function. Animals with a paretic side will not be able to climb up a cylinder uh, with symmetry. They'll uh, climb up using the good forepaw. We were able to show resolution of that. And when we put animals in a maze, a milky maze, and watch them swim to find a platform, it tests their locomotor, the visual motor, and their memory capabilities. We saw improvements in each one of those when we gave the animals uh, three doses of erythropoietin. So I draw your attention to the red bars where the three doses, you see the three doses compared to the yellow bars, which is the one dose. The black bar is the sham animal that had no injury. And you can see in, at least in, uh, it's best illustrated in the time to reach previous platform location, a memory test that the EPO-treated animals with three doses look just like the sham animals. That was very good news for us. We've also looked to see if we're actually creating new cells, and indeed we've uh, recently shown this. Um, it, this isn't projecting all that well, but you can see what we do is we give a marker into the brain when the animal is born. That's GFP, it's that green, those green dots you see in the upper panels. And then uh, we create the stroke at seven days or 10 days of life, and then treat the animal with erythropoietin three times, and then go on and measure um, proliferating cells. So not only do we see these newly, these newly born cells, we see them proliferating in the EPO occluded animals, and those are appearing as the pink bars this time in the um, graphs. On the right side of the field, the black is sham, uh, the yellow is just giving EPO to a sham animal, which actually has a good effect. The blue are the animals that have had the stroke and no treatment, and the pink are the animals that have EPO. And what we're measuring in that panel are cells that are proliferating by using an immunohistochemical stain uh, called KI67. And we can actually look to see which cells are being born in those brains. And on the left side of the panel, looking again at the red bars, you will see in the EPO-treated animals that have had a stroke, we're using a marker called double cordon, which marks those early neurons that are migrating away from their place of birth to their correct location in the brain. We see an increase in those cells compared to all the other conditions. And nu N, which is a marker of the mature neuron, is also increased in these brains. We see an increase in the cells that are also going to create white matter, myelin, the oligoprecursors, which is also good news, and that's on the left-hand side where we see the oligodendrocyte precursors increasing by the uh, red bars. And the best news of all is the scar is not forming. The scar is measured by a immunohistochemical marker, marker called GFAP that marks astrocytes, and that is actually decreased. This work was done by Fernando Gonzalez in our lab and has just been published in the journal Stroke. So what we found from these cell fate findings in an animal model, in comparison to no treatment in animals that receive stroke, that EPO treatment actually increased the number of new cells born. It increased the good types of cells, the immature neurons and the mature neurons. It increased the oligodendrocyte precursors, and it decreased that scar. So it really changed cell fate commitment, and this is what repair is. 
This is what happens down the road after that stroke, after the birth asphyxia, and this is what we need to target. So if we target early with hypothermia and give EPO later, we might have a chance at changing self-fate commitment and repairing the newborn brain. And this is, um, let me go, this, We've looked at giving this to human newborns, and we've just completed this phase one study. Yvonne Wu at UCSF is the principal investigator. We gave high dose erythropoietin in the setting of hypothermia. It was well tolerated. Uh, the drug uh, showed nonlinear pharmacokinetics, but there was no excess accumulation, and it did cross the blood-brain barrier. So we know now that we can move on to a phase three real randomized clinical trial. That trial has just been submitted to the National Institute of Health by Dr. Wu, and we hope that the hypothesis is that EPO will decrease the rate of death or moderate to severe disability at 24 months in newborns who have received EPO in the setting of hypothermia. These babies will still get hypothermia because hypothermia is standard of care in the United States, so we cannot deny that treatment. There are a number of ways that we can attack the injury cascade with multiple therapeutics. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this cartoon, but the cartoon illustrates all of those uh, black circles show it, types of mechanisms that can be targeted by a drug. So that tells us that we have multiple ways early at the primary uh, it, insult of global hypoxia ischemia or later after secondary energy failure or even further down the line like I just told you with uh, trying to create repair through angiogenesis and neurogenesis. So just a few words about the hypothermia trials. There have been five large randomized uh, clinical trials of hypothermia with outcomes at 18 to 24 month follow-up and now in two of the trials six to seven year follow-ups have been reported just uh, this year so the cool cap trial was a trial where we just cooled the head and tried to keep the body temperature warm the idea being not to put the baby at increased risk of having systemic effects from the hypothermia the NICHD trial and the TOBI trial were whole body cooling trials. So the baby was placed on a cooling blanket like I showed you in one of the initial slides. And the European network did whole, whole body trial. And the ICE trial was a very interesting trial done in Australia and New Zealand where they actually put ice packs on the liver of the babies to bring the uh, temperature down. And all of these trials, regardless of whether we cooled the head, the liver, or the whole body, showed benefit uh, for some of the babies without increasing mortality and without increasing uh, severe disability. So that has moved us on to being able to think about what we can add to hypothermia for these challenged newborns. This is a huge advance. This is the first therapy for these babies, and I must tell you, I never thought I was going to see it in my own lifetime. When you look at the meta-analysis of all these studies, what you see is that no matter, like I said, whether you cool the head or the body, you'll get a good effect. You'll decrease risk of death or moderate to severe disability. The number needed to treat is only seven, so it's an appropriate use of resources. And there are improved secondary outcomes with disability and the survivors reduced in every single one of the studies. At UCSF, we use MRI right after the cooling. So we warm the babies back up. We take them down into the MRI scanner. They're usually uh, four to five days old at that time. They're no longer cool. And we've seen great results. We've seen uh, a decrease in the extent of injury. Uh, 
we, both to uh, the basal ganglia, the, the most challenged re regions, and to also the uh, boundary zone regions. And we've also seen a shift away from that basal ganglia toward more normal scans in the babies that we've treated. Something interesting came out of one of the trials run by uh, the European network. Uh, they gave morphine as a adjunctive therapy to, so that the babies wouldn't be shivering and wouldn't be stressed. And what they found in this trial, uh, not all babies received the morphine, but the babies that received the morphine and who were cooled actually did better. So again, supporting the hypothesis that we need to add to hypothermia and we need to figure out what those drugs might be. This was a small study, but an encouraging study nonetheless. So if we can manipulate these pathways at different stages, at the beginning, hit inflammation, or target repair, we have a chance of improving outcomes. This is a wonderful study by uh, Mariana Thorson uh, from uh, Bristol, England, where she gave hypothermia, and the inert gas xenon. Xenon is a very expensive inhaled gas, but she designed a system to recirculate the xenon and uh, keep the uh, cost down. And she found that there was an improvement uh, in histopathology, but she also saw an improvement in function. She saw this, this is rat data, but she also saw this in swine as well. And the good news was that she could even delay the therapy up to three hours with the uh, hypothermia or the xenon and see an improvement. Ten weeks after the injury, when the, ba when the uh, baby rat becomes an adult rat or the baby piglet becomes more mature. The value of this is that xenon is also an anesthetic, and it could actually be given to the mother who is challenged during labor. So you could do it almost as a pretreatment against birth asphyxia safely and not even affect the baby. So you treat the mom, and then you could treat uh, the baby. There is now a xenon and hypothermia trial ongoing in Bristol and in Norway, and we await those results. So a num there are a number of best candidates, and it's going to be a challenge to try to figure out what we can study so that we can get it to the clinic faster. But antenatally, melatonin, xenon, allopurinol seem to be uh, leading candidates. Resveratrol, the, the uh, compound that's in red wine, and also pomegranate juice actually is protective if you feed moms uh, pomegranate juice and then create hypoxia ischemia in an animal model, you can pre prevent the hypoxic ischemic damage in uh, the babies whose moms receive pomegranate juice. So go out and buy some pomegranate juice if you're pregnant. Um, Postnatally, uh, melatonin and EPO seem to be the best candidates. Um, uh, it's EPO and EPO-like compounds. Uh, it's not just EPO twice on this list. Xenon again, uh, and anticonvulsants also have been shown in animal models to be protective. So while we're treating the seizures in these babies, we might also be treating the entire brain. And in response to these best candidates, there are a number of clinical trials now for birth asphyxia, for hypoxia ischemic encephalopathy. I don't put this up there for you to read everything, but I put it up there to show you that it is happening worldwide now. This attention has been drawn. And all of these trials are add-on therapies to hypothermia, which is great news. So we look forward to all of this information. So we treat the baby, we give the baby hypothermia, we give the baby a drug, drug X. Do we know whether it's doing anything? What are we gonna follow? How are we gonna mark the repair that might, we might see, like I showed you in the animal models? We can't take the brains out and count the number of cells. We have to find a better way of measuring that. And people at UCSF are doing that now by measuring functional connectivity, also called the connectome. 
So what is the connectome? It's actually the, a network of connections in the brain. On a microscopic scale, you might think of the neuron and the astrocyte communicating with one another. But in a macroscopic scale, using diffusion-weighted imaging, we can actually map out how the brain is talking to itself using diffusion images that can be obtained in 20 minutes or less. And we do this by using computerized algorithms that allow us to figure out how that information is clustering, and that's segregation, and how it's integrating. And that's measured by path length. And the more integration you have, the more rapidly the brain is communicating, the more clusters you have, the more communication that is possible. So we had the hypothesis that these properties of the connectome first depend on developmental age and will change over time and will also be altered by injury. I showed you a little bit of this yesterday when I showed you white matter injury affecting brain maturation and likewise the connectome is changed. This is the challenge. We have a brain that is undergoing massive changes over a very short period of time. The preterm baby to six day old term baby is a matter of weeks, but the complexity is changing drastically. And from six days to six months, again, drastically through adulthood. But using these diffusion-weighted color maps that you see there, we can calculate the brain networks. And in the C panel below, the baby who is six days old is imaged again at six months, and you can see the changes in those regions. This happened to be a baby who was actually damaged. And I'll show you what we found. First, we know that a maturation is occurring over time and that there are changes in clustering and path length that have a negative correlation with age. But more importantly, and this was just published a few months ago by Olga Timofieva in our group, that we can predict neurological outcome using the connectome. And we can see decreased clustering and increasing path length the opposite of what we want in the babies who have had neurological injury. So there's a trend to declining brain network integration and segregation at, with increasing motor deficits, and we can measure those deficits when they come back for these scans. So we can use this also not just to follow somebody who isn't being treated, but to follow somebody who is being treated and hope that we can reverse these graphs. But more importantly, that this is all very sophisticated imaging, and I don't expect anybody. We can barely understand what we're doing ourselves. How do we do this globally? And what, does it, what really matters in terms of the developing brain? What really matters is how we give the care, that the care is brain-focused, that is team-based, and the team is large and synchronized. We use neuroradiology to help guide our thinking and to help guide uh, our next steps. And we go hand in hand and neurology and neonatology to take care of these babies. And at the same time, we use our research to help guide next steps. All the time, we're trying to use developmentally appropriate infant care in the nursery to avoid stress in those fragile newborns, because the stress will make any damage worse. So our modeling starts with the specialized nurse. This nurse knows how to triage, knows how to do an initial clinical assessment, can apply the cooling blanket, can apply the amplitude integrated EG, just will stabilize the patient doing the normal things that we do uh, for advanced support. And then neurology comes in to try to help create the differential uh, and use some techniques that can help us do that. Those are the MR images that I showed you 
here and yesterday, and also video EG. Of greatest importance is managing the seizures that occur. Newborns will not manifest seizures clinically in all situations, and probably in most situations, and especially after we give them a drug called phenobarbital to stop any initial seizures. They will stop moving completely, but they can have status epilepticus on their EEG. This co-management model involves daily rounds, standardized guidelines, and I learned from the students at VHS uh, that they are working on the WHO ICF uh, paradigm to create uh, protocols and guidelines for a number of different conditions. This is critical, standardizing your care. Communicating with the family, anticipating needs. I think we do this well, but we can do it better, and I certainly learned from our colleagues the other day how well we could uh, get to do this. So we think co-management is an important model of care, you need resources available 24-7 to do this, though. You need to be able to call in the EEG tech to have neurology come to the bedside and assess the patient. You need to be able to put that baby on a cooling blanket within six hours of life, and you need to be able to monitor them. So you develop protocols so that everybody is doing the same thing all the time. And when we do this, we ask the question, has the baby suffered brain injury? How is the brain adapting? Does the infant need us, the neurologists? And most importantly, is that baby who's lying still on that isolate having seizures? And here again, you see the massive equipment that's required to answer some of these questions. Video EEG is our gold standard. We have trained technicians and experienced readers like Dr. Chilio who guide us. The Amplitude Integrated EEG is a great bedside tool. It's cheap, it's easy to use. You can train uh, the bedside nurses, techs to put these on and you can learn a lot. It won't tell you about every seizure that you see, but it'll tell you a lot about how the brain is reacting to what we're doing to the baby. We monitor baby, any baby who has high risk for seizures. We were talking earlier about who is fragile. Well, certainly any preterm baby is fragile. And then any baby who has had any episode of hypoxia ischemia, prolonged circulatory arrest, any sign of infection, stroke, hemorrhage, or cerebral edema that might be caused by an inborn nerve metabolism. We look for paroxysmal events but we don't often see them clinically, so we need the EEG. Sometimes we have to paralyze the babies because of pulmonary hypertension, and they have to be put on ECMO, so that really pushes us even further into monitoring them carefully. And we know that through these monitoring techniques, we can actually predict who's going to do better. And even something as simple as the amplitude EEG can tell you whether that baby's gonna do well. If that e amplitude integrated EEG normalizes within 24 hours of birth, you're gonna have a normal baby. That's great news and something that you can give to the parents. If they never achieve the cycling that we see uh, that should be associated with a normal brain, then we know we're dealing with a baby that's gonna be challenged and may have a poor outcome. And so we have to go on and do further testing. The characteristics of the EEG we've published, um, and uh, we also see similar kinds of findings where the EEG can predict outcome, uh, looking at epochs early uh, during cooling. So in summary, I hope I've shared with you the concept that there are many ways to achieve neuroprotection. This is fabulous news for all of us and for our vulnerable children. Hypothermia is now standard of care in the United States for babies born with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and throughout many countries. And I hope even in low resource settings, 
like the villages in your country, that you'll be able to do something as simple as use ice packs to keep the babies cool and, mo and monitor them without high-tech equipment just to preserve some of that uh, precious brain. The best strategies that we will develop will have to target multiple mechanisms. So this is not going to be as simple and easy magic bullet answer to this problem that we might be using hypothermia, we might use epolate to induce repair, we might be using something in between to reduce inflammation in the brain, and if we know enough about the condition of the fetus, we might even be treating the mother long before the baby's even born. We can use advanced MR techniques, both fetally and in the newborn period, it can show us what the injury is at or near the time of birth, and it can also show us how well we are with our therapeutic strategies, as I showed you with the developing connectome. We think brain-focused care, which sounds so simple, is the way to go, that team management and co-management is the only way to accomplish brain-focused care, and we think that it isn't a hard concept uh, to get out there, but we must continue to push this message as far as we can. There are many, many people at the University of California that contribute to my success for sure, and heading that list, and in alphabetical order, uh, James Barkovich, who is I consider the father of pediatric neuroradiology who has told us so much about how the brain has developed. You've met uh, Dr. Chilio over these past couple of days who has helped us with the epileptic encephalopathies and seizures and a whole host of individuals over two and a half decades that have worked diligently to try to figure out how the newborn brain is injured how that injury differs from injury in the adult, and have struggled with me to find funding to uh, research these questions. And we are thankful to the National Institute of Health of the United States, to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, American Heart Association, March of Dimes, Fondacion Le Duc, and others that have contributed uh, to these investigations. I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Professor Ferrero, for not only an excellent lecture, but a very inspiring one. Please give, give her a very big hand. The T.S. Srinivasan orations are always interesting, but this one is a bit different. It came with a lot of hope and uh, the possibility that there are things that we can do to make things better for our younger citizens. And I think the pioneering work that Professor Ferrero has talked about is really inspiring to all of us, something to look forward to. Uh, we have as a tradition questions, so the floor is open for questions from members of the audience. Yes, please. Please come to the mic, introduce yourself, and uh, ask a question. I'm Dr. Lango. My question is, uh, during the resuscitation process, should we switch the warmer on or should we keep it off? The, um, we have had a tendency to over-oxygenate and heat our babies. And I would say that you might want to, in a severely asphyxiated baby, keep the warmer off. There are neonatologists in the room who can comment about that. But the key to salvaging that, I'm talking about the term newborn now, not a preterm baby. Uh, salvaging that brain is getting that brain cool quickly. And to heat the baby up only to try to cool it down 
uh, immediately after you resuscitate is just you're fighting against yourself. So keeping the ambient temp using ambient temperature to help you. And of course here it's a little bit hotter, so you might want to start thinking about passive cooling. So what is the lowest temperature you can achieve with hypothermia? What is the lowest, lowest temperature. Temperature. temperature? You shouldn't go below 33.5. So you need to monitor temperature carefully. Professor, my name is Raju Gopal. A family friend of ours had a grandchild born about four months ago. The baby was born with the brain half filled with water. We had a neurosurgeon in the same institute, World Health Services. The baby was uh, rushed to that surgeon and he said an immediate surgery must be performed. And if the baby would stand anesthesia, it will survive. He has already done about 15, 20 surgeries. Now it's recuperating. I know it's a difficult question to ask because you're not seeing the baby at the records. In such cases, what is the chance of survival of the baby, number one? Number two, normal functioning of the brain. So much depends on what the etiology of that lesion is. So if you're describing a baby with half, half. of Not a half. brain, you're thinking about a baby that has had a huge uh, acquired injury sometime before birth in utero. Um, those babies will invariably have abnormal outcomes. Because even though the injury, it really does depend on when the injury occurs, but even though the, uh, uh, e even if the injury is early in gestation, you're going to end up with some difficulty because not all of the ipsilateral connections can compensate for what is lost. Chances of normalcy in brain future? Normalcy. Chance, normalcy. Chances of a normal brain. The brain isn't going to grow back into that space. And so it, you can learn a lot by looking at the baby now. So the baby has certain functions that you can map and monitor. And so that exam now will tell you about future prognosis. Thank you. I'm Yen Narin Ranjan. I'm doing a research work on the brain itself. My father had a paralytic attack when he was 86. Half his body was paralyzed. He became vegetable, totally a vegetable child. So six days doctors attended on him. On the sixth day, I took him to the bathroom, filled the bucket with hot water, moderately high, filled the bucket with warm water, um, filled the bucket with hot water with moderately high, and opened the cold water tap started pouring on his head. Meantime, I closed the hot water tap, again started pouring on his head for nearly 20 minutes. <coughs> what happened is, when the temperature fell down, I mean, when the temperature of water falls below, near to less than 20 centigrade, not more than that, 15 centigrade, so the body temperature fell down. Blood started rushing to the surface area to protect the skin. Actually, <laughs> the blood that went to sh in, the, in the surface area has to, uh, by the contraction of the Can blood I ask muscle, you to ask your question, sir? No, no. This is another thing. This is a very important thing. Uh, the blood rushes to the surface area to protect the skin. Meantime, the blood vessel contracted. He had an embolism in the blood vessel. That's the reason that he had blocked the entire brain from, uh, from uh, it happened to be a paralytic attack. So, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Right then. You are Can I ask you for your comment? Thing. Okay. Right then. Um, I think he's asking about use of cold water in adults as a way of the uh, hypothermia stress. treatments for adults are used um, out of hospital cardiac arrest successfully hypothermia for stroke um, their studies are still ongoing they are not as encouraging as those for um, cardiac arrest in or out of hospital 
uh, cardiac arrest in children. Hypothermia trials are also ongoing now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please, uh, we can't hear you very well. Yeah. No, 30 degrees Fahrenheit is zero. No, no, 33.5 Celsius. 33? Uh, that's the, okay, right. <laughs> now, what about uh, the skin when you keep ice packs for the baby? How do you protect uh, the skin from getting frostbites? And so you wouldn't immerse the baby in freezing water, right? You would use a cooling blanket or in low resource settings, people have used cold water bottles on the liver or the chest. No, There's always a chance that the skin will erode in those areas and that was seen with the cool cap trial. But you wouldn't immerse a baby. Yeah, no, you mentioned in villages, you know, we can, could just keep uh, ice packs, like probably in a polythene bag and... Uh, yeah, you have to rotate because they'll... Uh, okay. There will be skin No, Now, emotion. during normal delivery, we see, like, uh, we are very fussy, switch off the air condition and then, you know, cover the baby. And is it really essential to do that or...? Uh, you know, in normal deliveries, and the baby comes out normal and is active and has great APGAR scores, you should just continue doing what you're doing. But if you have a severely depressed baby, you want to get that baby cool as fast as possible. But you should do it with a protocol that you've developed in your hospital so that everybody's doing exactly the same thing and the baby is being accurately monitored. No, my doubt is like uh, you say you can create hypothermia for neuroprotection, then why do we, why are we so particular that we should uh, keep the baby like warm as soon as it's born? Because we haven't advanced enough yet. <laughs> why do we give 100% oxygen for so many decades? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, with MRI, which is guiding uh, your treatment of these early uh, uh, difficulties yes. and also is antenatal diagnosis uh, a, a real possibility as we go forward and uh, also uh, do, you, do you conceptualize MRI based treatments as well going forward? Yes, so you should ask Dr. Suresh. Uh, the, um, Who's here? Uh, we should, uh, uh, we, we definitely will use more and more fetal MRI to diagnose difficulties and we've uh, been able to impact care, well-being and outcome of babies. I think the best example is the MOMS trial where we've treated babies with, for spina bifida uh, fetally in intrauterine surgery with great outcomes. And maybe you might want to make a comment. So there's a mic behind you. I think fetal MRI in terms of uh, neuro is, is a very important uh, investigation. At present, we exclusively use it for when we identify a structural abnormality to see very anything more than ultrasound which we can pick up. But what I would believe in the future will be functional MRI. If it comes in a big way in the fetus, then we would probably look. We are not in a position to identify uh, cerebral palsy at this point uh, in utero or predict that this baby would have cerebral palsy. Though there is a, a small research that has gone on in, uh, uh, in Croatia uh, where they have studied fetal behavioral patterns on four-dimensional ultrasound to see whether the baby is grimacing, smiling, and then they have correlated all these events to an immediate postnatal event. So there's, there is some study going on at this point, and by which the uh, professor, um, he uh, thinks that we would be able to identify cerebral palsy in utero. But I think we are still far away from it on its universal application. Can I ask one other question to both of you? The safety of repeated MRIs in, in mothers who, are, who have uh, potentially difficult births ahead of them. Yeah, I, I know of no uh, indications against. I think you would never want to sedate a mother to try to sedate the baby to reduce movement, which there's, you wish the baby would stop moving, but a moving baby is a good baby. Uh, but no, there, there are no, no contraindications. Yes, doctor. 
Dr. Morgan, pediatric neurologist from Chennai. Um, you rightly pointed out 56 babies needed to be undergo hypothermic treatment to prevent one cerebral palsy. Uh, my question is, would it be cost effective to introduce that for India? Yeah, so it's uh, six to seven babies need to be treated to reduce um, uh, a morbid outcome. Uh, so the 56 number was for antenatal magnesium to reduce CP. So antenatal magnesium is probably not as cost effective, although it's a great tocolytic. Uh, but hypothermia can be done cheaply and wisely with good protocols, even passively. So I think it absolutely would be. And in fact, uh, Nikki Robertson, the woman who did the experiments with the piglets that I showed you with um, hypothermia and melatonin, is doing uh, a study here in India in a low resource setting. Uh, to see how effective they are and to make sure it's safe. Thanks. We'll take one last question. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to know, uh, is there, I, I've even had, uh, you know, I, I, I came across certain evidences about male predominance in pediatric stroke. What would you talk, uh, tell about that as a comment? Male predominance. <laughs> Um, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you it's true. Uh, there's uh, a male predominance in uh, the newborn period in neonatal stroke. There's male predominance for every type of stroke seen in childhood. And Heather Fullerton has looked at this. She's actually looked at, there was a theory that uh, at least in childhood, boys are more active, more uh, you know, exposed to trauma, and trauma could be a risk factor for stroke. But even in the, if she controlled for that, she still saw an increase. So we don't know. <laughs>